Hello, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman, and with me today is Carr Ingham, one of the really great individuals in the Texas oil and gas industry. He's the uh, executive VP and, and economist at the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, and he is the creator and maintainer of the Texas Petro Index, which we're going to talk about here at the top of the show. How are you doing, Carr? Well, I'm doing great, David. How are you doing this morning? Thanks for the kind words, by the way. I feel the same way about you. (laughs) Carr and I have known each other a long time, long time. Gosh, 20 years now, probably. Oh, uh, yeah. At least. Uh, Yeah, every bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, time flies when you're having fun, right? (laughs) Time. time Uh, That's a fact. My life is passing me by. (laughs) Well, you're making good use of it, though. That's that's the important thing. So before we get in, I you know just just talk about you know your background and and uh, and and also how you know the concept behind the Texas Petro Index and what gave you the idea in the first place of creating it. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I I live in Amarillo, Texas, right now, up here in the North Country. I grew up farther north than here, uh, but still in Texas, actually in the little northern panhandle town of Stratford, Texas, which is about ah. 10 miles from the Oklahoma state line up there. And then I grew up on a farm and ranch 10 miles northeast of there yet, out in the middle of nowhere, just dangerously close to the state of Oklahoma up there. <laughs> and uh, been in Amarillo for quite a while. And um, I, uh, my, so my schooling is in economics. And years and years ago, back in the early to mid 90s, I worked at a great bank here in Amarillo, Amarillo National Bank, which at that time was, it may still be the largest privately held family owned bank in the country. And so this bank did, still does, a little piece of work called the Amarillo Economic Pulse. And so what this does is just take a group of local economic indicators and scrub them through a spreadsheet and model and spit out a one number economic index on the backside of that. And so when I worked there, because my schooling was in economics, this piece of work landed on my desk. All due respect to Amarillo National Bank, I never wanted to be a banker one day in my life, but I I was there for a couple of years. And and, uh, this was the outgrowth of that, frankly, because I thought, well, that's a great idea. And I couldn't use their model, of course, so I had to sort of set about and create my own. And... um, so I came up with this model for tracking local economies through this indexing process. And one of the early places I began to do this work in the latter half of the 1990s was in Midland, Odessa. And I had very little exposure to oil and gas then. I grew up in the ag world. I worked in D.C. once upon a time for our then Congressman Bo Bolter. I did his ag and trade wow. work, not oil and gas work. And, um, and was his district guy for a while. And this was all centered around farming and ranching, not oil and gas, although we had a lot of that up here. And, um, but you can't do general economic work in Midland, Odessa, and the Permian without turning yourself into an oil and gas guy. And so I began to track oil and gas indicators there, and I kind of created a separate little index to lay alongside the general economic index in Midland, Odessa, called the Texas Permian Basin Petroleum Index just to sort of inform, you know, the impact of that industry on the general economy there. Yeah. By the way, the general economy there is that industry. That's about all right. there is to it. Yeah. Um, uh, but this caught the attention of Bill Stevens, who was then the executive director of the West Central Texas Oil and Gas Association. They merged with the North Texas Oil and Gas Association in 2000 to become the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, a statewide organization. And then Alex Mills, who ran the alliance, engaged me to put together this piece of work called the Texas Petro Index, which is, again, just a tracking device for calculating growth rates and tracking business cycles in the upstream or exploration and production part of the Texas oil and gas industry. So we rolled that Texas Petro Index out in 2003, I believe, to great fanfare, frankly, in Houston uh, with the media there, the oil and gas trade press. Uh, and so this has been a thing that's had quite a lot of media attention since then. Um, and again, its job is to uh, inform not only oil and gas operators about sort of where we are in a cycle and what that looks like, how this has changed structurally over time, 
but also policymakers. What is the ongoing relationship of the oil and gas industry in Texas to the Texas statewide economy? What does oil and gas employment look like? What share of the overall economy does it make up? How is this changing over time? What does this look like in the regions around Texas where we produce oil and gas? North Texas, East Texas, South Texas, the Permian. What's the impact of the industry on Houston? Um, so you break it down by region? And- I actually do not, but okay. uh, but it but it uh, but you can take a lot of that data and just look at how it continues to affect the region. So the only two things that I do now are a statewide piece of work, and then the Permian Basin Petroleum Index. Okay. Uh, but but it's uh, but it, it still helps uh, to inform what's going on in North Texas, which is sort of the legacy region, North Texas, West Central Texas of the alliance. But also, of course, um, Houston has been uh, and I would say still remains the global capital for oil and gas. They seem to want to yeah. fancy themselves an energy transition economy now, depending on who you're talking to now. Um, but that's still an oil and gas town. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, they do, they don't like to admit it. The city government there, you know, and really, I mean, it's not just the Sylvester Turner uh, administration there, but I mean, it's it's been the case for really probably since you created the index, and even well, before, uh, that, that's that true. The city that's doesn't true. want to admit that it's still well. The in some the respects, they do. I mean, uh, you know, they they're still they're still generally friendly, of course, to the oil and gas business. There are a great many of them there, but it just seems like we can scarcely keep ourselves from wanting to jump on the energy transition bandwagon in some respect. And my goodness, you know, if I were in some position of leadership there, I might feel the same way, but I'm not, and I don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so the, the index, it, to a large extent, it really is a good measure of the, the, the general health of the industry, right, historically. It, it, without a doubt. History. I mean, uh, that yeah. thing has proven to be uh, very effective and responsive to cyclical changes in the industry. Yeah. But now having the opportunity to look back on this, I mean, we've had, so we based this thing in January of 1995. And the reason we picked that point in time was we didn't want to, we mean me in the Alliance um, leadership then, we didn't want to go back all the way to 1980, for example, and try to capture all of that craziness. Um, uh, so this is sort of a modern uh, index, but there, there were significant events in the oil and gas industry um, in Texas in particular in, uh, in 1998, 1999. So we want to go back far enough to capture those and then just bring this thing forward. So when we roll this out, um, you know, again, in 2003, that was the, that was the seminal economic event in oil and gas that we captured up to that point. But think about what we've now captured since then. That's been chronicled by the Texas petrol index, where the massive run up in oil and gas activity between 2002 and 2008, when crude oil prices went from 20 bucks a barrel to nearly 150 bucks a barrel, natural gas prices went from a buck and buck and a quarter up to eight, 10, 12, um, 15 bucks uh, and uh, MMBTU. Um, and even as high as crude oil prices were this, that period of time, uh, which you well know was when the Barnett shale was being cracked open. Right. And so even though we had crude oil prices of 140 bucks a barrel during that six year span of time, 80% of the rigs in Texas were drilling for natural gas, not for crude oil. <laughs> and they were principally in the Barnett and some other places. And the Permian was still pretty crude oil intensive. And so what, what, yeah, but what, it was all the old conventional stuff. You got you know, it. And, you got it. That's yeah. absolutely right. And so, uh, and then what knocked the uh, what knocked the industry off its tracks then was the Great Recession uh, right. uh, uh, of two thousand eight nine, um, and then and then off we go with the right. second fantastic yeah. period of expansion in which crude oil prices exceeded a hundred bucks a barrel. They didn't get as high as they were previously. And then all of a sudden we flip flop. Crude oil prices recovered, natural gas prices do not. And then we began to apply these production techniques of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing to the Permian and other places. And, uh, and this is the period of time in which we explode, literally explode. U.S. domestic and Texas, led by Texas, by the way, 
uh, crude oil and natural gas production, crude oil production in particular. And so during this period of time, we we began to really grow U.S. domestic crude oil production. And so uh, so this was an extraordinary period of growth. And all of this is transformational stuff uh, because we're figuring out how to produce vast quantities of crude oil and natural gas with technology. Um, and uh, at that time, we're still needing vastly more drilling rigs, vastly more uh, uh, oil and gas employees. And we peaked out at the end of that cycle in late 2014 in terms of both rigs and employees. Right. Yeah. We have never been as high. In fact, nowhere close. Yeah, we uh, had over 2,000 rigs active at one point, right? Oh, nationally. nationally, we did. Yeah, we had nearly 1,000 in Texas in the yeah. final uh, yeah. weeks of 2014. And then, of course, what happens in 2015? Well, uh, the, the, the nasty downturn in 2008, 2009 was, I would say, a demand-driven event. We had a global, national global recession, which tanked energy demand, which sent all these things crashing downward 2015 2016 no such thing the economy is doing just fine u.s economy is growing texas economy is growing global economy is growing and we have a much nastier downturn in 2015 and 2016 than we did in 2008 2009 this was a supply driven event uh because the u.s has is on the way to doubling and then more than doubling U.S. crude oil production, again, with Texas leading the way. OPEC is really backed into a corner because they don't know how to respond to this extraordinary production increase in the U.S. They hold off on, on production declines, and they hold off, and they hold off, and they kept thinking, oh, goodness, the U.S. is now the swing producer. Operators are going to respond to these crashing prices in a hurry. Production is going to fall far and fast. So they maintain a high level of production most of the way through this nasty crash. And this was indeed a bloodbath of a downturn uh, here. We lost tens of thousands of oil and gas jobs in Texas. The rig count cratered. Um, and then we began to recover from this in another cycle that is driven by different things. The 2010 to 2000. 14, 15 increase was driven by increases in rig counts and employments and permits and well completions and all of these things. And we're beginning to grow production. The, the recovery post-2016 up until, well, COVID, maybe probably 2019, actually, yeah. end of 2018, yeah. was driven by production itself climbing to record levels. This occurred in 2018, really nationally and in Texas, uh, exceeding old records, which were from the early 1970s. And so we're establishing new production records for crude oil and natural gas, by the way, without record rig counts, without record employment. In fact, both of those are vastly lower than they were in late 2014. And so this increase, which again, captured by the Texas Petro Index, is driven by Number one, the, volume, the sheer volume of crude oil and natural gas production in Texas, and then the value of that production as well, because we had recovering uh, prices that were, uh, that were fairly decent. Um, and actually, the downturn in the Texas statewide oil and gas economy <clears throat> that we connect to COVID was actually in place for all of 2019 before yeah. COVID even came along, driven by what? Well, prices were weakening somewhat for one thing. But the nature of the industry was changing. And this is a phenomenon that you're familiar with. I mean, yes, sort of liken, lot, it, yeah. liken it to a hamster wheel leading up to this point where, uh, where tons and tons of cash is just thrown into development. The acquisition of acreage uh, and the drilling of wells. And what begins to happen in 2019? Well, two or three things begin to happen in 2019. First of all, investors are getting a little tired of this and they want some return on this investment. They don't want to plunk every dollar and then another three or four dollars on top of that into new development. They want right. some return on their investment and who can blame them for this? Well, this does have a dampening impact on drilling activity. What else was happening in 2019? Well, we were flaring a lot of natural gas in 2019, particularly in the Permian, because with every barrel of oil. Didn't have enough uh, pipeline capacity. Not enough pipeline. So yeah. 
so there's a big spotlight on flaring in the Permian, uh, which I, I think, I mean, if you're drilling an oil well in the Permian, but you have no disposition option for the gas that's going to come up with that oil, you have to think twice about, now we were still drilling a lot of wells out there, but not as many as we would have absent this natural gas problem. Right. And so then comes COVID, uh, the quickest. <laughs> wait, before you go to COVID, wait. Sure. Before you go to COVID, though, yeah. I, I think it's important to point out that because I, I think most people don't don't realize this, that that shift from the drilling frenzy into focus on return of investment to investors is part of the natural cycle of the development of any oil and gas resource in history, right? This Without was not something unique to U.S. shale in 2018 and 2019, and they, there's such a, I mean, maybe talk about that because there's a real misunderstanding, a lack of understanding about that reality of things in the general public. Well, and it, it it's not it's not only unique to oil and gas and all of its long history. It's not unique to the investor community and all right. industries. Yeah. So the things that have happened um, in oil and gas, these transformational events that have occurred. Uh, the the investor sentiment that comes along with this, um, none of this is new or unique. Industries of uh, uh, of all kinds endeavor to do what the oil and gas industry did so uh, so famously and overtly and noticeably, and that is to become more efficient over time. Yeah, to produce more with less and at a lower cost. Um, and my goodness, uh, the, the, the industry has done this in spades and contributed, by the way, uh, to, the, to an extraordinary consumer outcome. And we, we'll talk more about that momentarily yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, this investor sentiment thing as well. I mean, it's the, the fact it's pretty simple. I mean, just consider yourself plunking investment dollars into anything. At some point, if you're not getting a return on those dollars, you're not going to continue to plug, plunk, uh, plug that money into it. It is that simple. And so, again, uh, this is not a souring of investors on U.S. oil and gas or the shale industry. It is right. just a desire on the part of investors to achieve a return on that investment. And there is nothing remotely um, unusual uh, or suspect about that. In fact, how, how could you not suspect that uh, exactly. this is what they would want? And so yeah. um, these are natural, as you properly suggest, these are natural market outcomes. And I do not care. And it's not <laughs> my place to say what investors ought, to, ought or ought not to do with their money uh, uh, when it is their own decision. Uh, sure. Affected by things that want to skew markets. Um, and if they determine and when they determine that they want uh, a different outcome for the dollars that they're investing, uh, who are, who am I, who are you, who are, who's anybody else to suggest that this is somehow problematic or, uh, right. or, or, or reflects a, uh, a, a, a changing sentiment. And again, sort of a souring on, on the, on the industry, which is ridiculously how this was portrayed on many right. occasions. And, and really for the companies, you know, hasn't this investor pressure to kind of calm down and stop this drilling frenzy and focus more on economies of scale and, and improving processes and, and rationalizing headcounts and all that? Hasn't it really for the companies, you know, here looking back now in 2023, produced a healthier state of the industry here in Texas? than you probably otherwise would have had because you have so much less debt now, even, even with COVID intervening. It, and you have these companies now in a stable and steady program from year to year, you know, uh, which had not been the case during that, you know, initial development build out of, of the Permian and the Eagle Ford, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, oh, and by the way, <laughs> let's not give short shrift to the Eagleford or Eagle yeah. Ford, as you say, I think yeah. lazy Texans just all call that the Eagle Ford. <laughs> when you see it all written down, it looks like two words, Eagle Ford, but uh, I guess that's just one word. Yeah. I, I was, I was corrected by a fellow at Conoco <laughs> Phillips early in the play. And uh, I, I've been careful about that ever since. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, 
uh, this was one of those uh, fantastic things that occurred in that um, uh, kind of uh, uh, ending of the cycle, growth cycle in 2008, and then kind of spanning the recession and then moving on. Uh, past the recession through 2014, 2015, there was scarcely a barrel of oil produced out of this formation called the Eagleford or Eagle Ford uh, until about 2008. Yeah. And so this thing blows onto the scene and begins to produce extraordinarily rapidly rising quantities of crude oil and natural gas. And as if uh, the state of Texas wasn't impressive enough. Uh, and its energy profile and what we're contributing nationally, this was a big part uh, of the state's contribution um, to U.S. growth in oil and gas production. Yeah, and we so were the only healthy industry in the United States in the first term of the Obama administration. I believe that, anyway. is, I believe that is correct. Yeah. And so now, um, you know, so th this was a really blooming rose in that period of time, and it got all manner of attention. And uh, meanwhile, though, I'm sort of noticing that the Permian is sitting over here and it's just sort of rumbling and percolating underneath the surface a little bit. You know, the Eagleford's getting all kind of attention about its fantastic growth because going from zero to, uh, you know, pretty high quantities of production gets a lot of attention. And we have production growth in the Permian at that period of time, but it is not yet what it was going to be because, again, it's, it's like you got this new shiny rose over here called the Eagleford, and it's fantastic. But you've got this old thing called the Permian over here. But it again, it just feels to me like it's dialing up to do something. Um, and sure enough, uh, these, these extraordinary increases in productivity begin to take root in the Permian as these production yeah. techniques that were developed for natural gas production in Barnett and other places um, are beginning to be deployed in, in, in the Permian and then boom, off we go. Um, and so the Permian in both Texas and New Mexico, I always think about this in 2010, the state of Texas produced about 20% of all of the nation's crude oil. Well, that's pretty impressive. That's one fifth from one state. You know what that number was? You know what it is right now? It's like 42%. Yeah, 42% of Texas production, or pardon me, U.S. production comes from uh, from Texas alone. The interesting thing about this is the Permian was, the Permian, even including New Mexico, was always producing less of the nation's total crude oil than the state of Texas was. That's now flip-flopped. Yeah. Uh, the Permian as a whole, including New Mexico, is producing more. And this is about 45, 46% of the nation's crude oil comes out of the Permian now. Uh, so these, these two or three counties in New Mexico have really uh, grown uh, activity and production. And so these are extraordinary outcomes and they should be yeah. great outcomes. The, I don't know if you track this, but uh, wouldn't Texas be like if it was a country, just Texas? Yes. Wouldn't Texas be the fourth or fifth largest producing country on earth if it was a standalone. Uh, I, I have tracked that, and uh, and I, I was really tracking this back in uh, the early part of uh, of twenty twenty two, um, and I haven't looked at those numbers since then, so I need to be a little bit careful about this. But Texas. Um, at its peak, pre-COVID was producing a little over 5.4 million barrels a day. Um, the U.S. was producing uh, at its peak in late 2019 13, about 13 yeah. million barrels a day. Um, so you've got you've got the U.S. in first place uh, as a country producer, followed by uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, I think, and they start to fall off after that. Right. Um, and uh, exactly we're where back, that dividing back line to, is. What, 12.6 in March about this that, year, right? About that, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, most of us thought, though, that both in Texas and nationally, we would have recovered pre-COVID daily production levels, and we have yet to do that either in Texas or nationally. So it's been kind of a slow slog upward in terms of production increases for probably two or three reasons one of which is that drilling activity has been a little subdued because of the things that we've talked about. But the other yeah. of which clearly is just this open hostility by our own government 
uh, to U.S. domestic oil and gas production. And this particularly takes place and takes hold on federal lands where the U.S. government has a lot more to say about this. Thankfully, we have very little of this in Texas. Yeah. Uh, but nationally, you know, once upon a time, again, pre-COVID, crude oil production from federal lands and waters was approaching about 25% of national production. And so you can cut into this pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and you also have, in addition to the U.S. federal hostility to domestic oil and gas production, increasing blue state hostility. I mean, just think Colorado, where they just seem intent on putting that industry out of business and independent operators up there in particular. Yeah. Um, and, and New Mexico, too. You know, well, New Mexico, like my goodness. So this is the this is the proverbial goose that laid the golden uh-huh. egg. Um, and uh, they uh, they want to shoot that goose, I guess. It's crazy. I, it, it is you crazy. know, we we fund like forty percent of the state budget up there. That's right. Want, want to kill it? It's it's that's just right. Boggles the mind. I uh, on the transition. So on on the energy transition. You know, we we hear all this talk about it, and uh, I know you have as an economist views on this. And, and one thing I, I talk about and write about a lot is the fact that we're trying to replace this the, these energy dense, high energy density forms of, of energy like fossil fuels and nuclear with these low energy density forms. And it defies the laws of physics and the laws of thermodynamics. But doesn't it also, isn't what we're trying to do also stand in defiance of the laws of supply and demand, right? Because well, demand for our, for oil and gas keeps going up, right? Demand for energy keeps going up, right. which means demand for oil and gas keeps going up. I mean, this still supplies, depending on how you want to slice this, 85% plus uh, of right. our energy is still provided by fossil fuels. Now, you have to throw coal into the mix uh, there as well. We're talking about power generation. But particularly in terms of uh, of uh, powering transportation, uh, we're simply talking about oil and gas. Um, and uh, so, yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, I've got a I've got a a, a favorite saying um, that I tend to give uh, uh, at at uh, when I give speeches and presentations, and, and it is this: the foundational laws and principles of economics. And I might throw in their physics as well, but the foundational laws and principles of economics are not are not set aside or altered just because we're talking about something you have to feel strongly about. You can <laughs> wish that they didn't exist, but they do. And unfortunately, they've been around for a long time. They call them laws for a reason. The law of supply and demand. These are pretty sacrosanct things um, in economics. And no, they cannot be done away with. So it's not going to change. The same thing I would suggest applies to physics, which I know considerably less about than I do economics. So I don't want to wade too far off into that, but you're exactly right. 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 Yeah. And um, so the bigger question about this transition, and you used an interesting word uh, a minute ago, and you would have no you you would have no reason to think that this word was remotely interesting to me when you said it. And this was this word we. You just said we are trying to. Oh, yeah, I do that too much. <laughs> uh, well, no, I'm not suggesting you do it too much, but I always wonder and have begun to wonder and have begun to, I wouldn't say push back, but to raise the question of who we actually is. Who, who is we? Uh, and this is a very common phraseology in our politics. We have to do this. Right. We yeah. have to move our economy. Uh, beyond this fossil fuel uh, dependent and driven economy to a clean, we have to do this, we have to do that. Well, somebody needs to tell me who we is exactly. Because whoever makes that statement, that particular statement, we have to, we have to get off fossil fuels. We have to, well, in, in that case, we does not include me. Um, yeah. So I have a disagreement, not with you, David Blackman, but with you, whoever it is that says this to me, we, I do not, this is not a view that I share, um, at, at least in terms of taking, uh, uh, coercive governmental action 
that moves us off of where markets would take us uh, if we just left this to markets alone. If markets ultimately take us through a transition, believe it or not, I have no issue with this at all. Sure. If markets absolutely. ultimately move us away from oil and gas to what comes next, that's how this is supposed to work. So we have a disagreement. Yeah. Me and you, me and whoever would make that statement. And how do we settle these disagreements? Well, we have we have historically in the U.S. settled these disagreements, and let's call one a political disagreement and one an economic disagreement. An economic disagreement, uh, for me, is pretty easy to settle. I have nothing to say about it. You have nothing to say about it. The market has everything to say about it. Right. I am passionate. You're passionate. Whoever, um, whoever would make such a statement about moving us off fossil fuels and then uh, uh, onto uh, renewables or whatever comes next. Well, they're crazy passion about this, but we have a disagreement about this. And how do we settle this? Well, I can either bludgeon you over the head or you can bludgeon me over the head and force me uh, to comply with your point of view, or I can do the same to you, or we can just slug this out in the competitive marketplace and let it determine uh, what comes next. So that's a pretty simple solution. Uh, right. But, uh, but of course, everything's now political, right? Well, of course, it is. everything's become politicized. And, and another thing, I, and I wonder if you agree, we have, we have a, a growing energy crisis. It, it started in Europe. It's, you know, becoming more of a global thing. And it's, it's all, every bit of it is driven by policy, by public policy. If the market was left to function and determine things... We wouldn't be having these crises all over the place. Oh, the, I believe system. this is exactly right. I mean, Europe's attempt to go green has backfired on them in, in the in the, yeah. uh, in the in the um, in unimaginable. Well, actually, it was quite imaginable. Uh, you know, those of us I think who have have a propensity to look ahead and try to understand what the spin out effects of these sorts of moves may be could have really seen this coming. And the only thing uh, that uh, that put me personally, you know, I have a little bit of a conundrum about, uh, as, as you well know, we've had this discussion before. I'm the ultimate free trader. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm the ultimate free trader because I believe in the autonomy of the individual in making his or her own economic decisions. Um, and if, uh, and, uh, you know, nations do different things uh, well. Some nations are set up to, uh, because of the natural resources they have, or whatever the case may be, to have a competitive advantage uh, in many respects. Russia is one of those nations. They got a lot of energy. They produce more than they consume domestically. And what would they do with the rest of this? Well, uh, they would send it out to other parts of, um, of the world and to some of their uh, European neighbors there and make it available for them. Well, this shouldn't be a problem. Uh, until you throw politics into the mix um, and tyrants into the mix. Yeah, in a war, um, yeah. Uh, there's so much discussion about Nord Stream 1 and 2 and about this reliance on Russian energy. Um, uh, if you throw all the rest of this nonsense out, it makes perfect sense when you think about it. They've got it. We can access it by land through a pipeline or, uh, or undersea through a pipeline, whatever the case may be. We can use your excess uh, to our advantage. Um, and, uh, of course, because of politics, this has blown up as well. But I have no issue with energy trade among nations, and that includes Russia and Europe. I'm sort of uh, in the minority in that view, I think, and was even then. Uh, but uh, this is a thing that um, in normalized political circumstances would make a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, in addition to uh, now uh, being unable to rely on the Russian supply of natural gas, uh, they've uh, they've cratered their own energy infrastructure by doing away not just with coal plants but trying to trying to evaporate nuclear as well, and rely entirely on renewables, which is just nonsense, pure farce. Um, and so these moves that these nations made, I don't understand. I further don't understand why witnessing this, we would presume to go down this path at all. Um, and yet here we are. It's like we're copying the same game plan. Sure. Listen, man, I am afraid we are running out of time here. But I, before we before we stop, I want to let 
give you a chance, and I didn't, I should have done it up front, to tell people where they can find you, where they can find the Texas Petro Index. So that they, you know, that people, so our viewers can keep up with, with you. Uh, and, absolutely. And the well, I'm, uh, I would not be an oil and gas economist were it not for this great organization called the yeah. Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. And that, that, that's just a fact. The Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, a statewide upstream oil and gas trade association in Texas. We represent principally independent operators and their interests, uh, both in Austin and Washington, D.C. So it is for them and for our members and for the industry in Texas and also nationally, frankly, that I do this work. And so we release the Petro Index every month in a news release. We put it uh, on our website, uh, texasalliance.org. Uh, so you can find it there, and we're getting to re, getting ready to reconstitute a monthly publication called Newsline, which will be sort of centered oh, around the Texas Petro Index. So um, uh, just go to our website, uh, TexasAlliance.org, or just do a search on the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. You can find that information there. You can find our information there. Connect with myself, our president, Jason Modulin. Uh, in Austin, um, if uh, if you want more information on the uh, Texas Petro Index, the oil and gas industry in Texas in general, uh, but uh, but but again, I do this for them, and that's where you can find this piece of information. Well, fantastic, man! We just scratched the surface here. I had like a dozen other questions I, I was going to ask, and I had like a dozen other things I really wanted to rail on. But yeah, so, so let's so let's let's do, do it this again, again sometime. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get back here in a month or two and, and do it again. And I really appreciate your time. Hope you have a great weekend. And uh, that's all for this episode of the Energy Question. Uh, I want to thank Stu Turley and the Sandstone Group for producing our show and our excellent producer, Eric Perel. I'm David Blackman, signing off for now.